We are pleased to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Klaus Mosmeyer, a member of the Executive Committee and Chief Ethics, Risk and Compliance Officer at Novartis. Klaus has forged a global reputation as a leader in the field of ethics and compliance, notably becoming the first head of compliance from a company to be invited to address the United Nations General Assembly in the fight against corruption. In his current role at Novartis, he is transforming ethics, risk and compliance by harnessing innovation and technology to cement ethics within the core of the business. He states that, a culture of ethics and psychological safety in corporations is not a given. Co-creation of the ethical commitments, use of behavioral science insights, and a long-term strategy to support, engage, and nudge the organization are needed. Yeah, hello, and uh, thank you everyone for, for having me again at your great conference. And let's go together on a, on a journey, on a, on a very relevant topic for us as part of society, because companies are part of society, that how can we operationalize ethics in big organizations? And I will speak uh, a little bit about our own journey at Novartis and give you some insights today, not on the risk management part, not so much on the compliance part, but really focused on our ethics journey. Again, which is a journey which potentially will be never completed because we are all driven by the context where we are living, our environment, and this shapes, of course, our ethical challenges every day. Maybe another uh, remark, I'm, I'm talking here to you from Italy because I have the honor to speak tomorrow at the, finding, the final, the concluding uh, uh, B20 summit for the ones who don't know what B20 is. B20 is part of the G20 process, which is every year hosted by one government of the G20, G20 countries. This year it is Italy, then handing over to Indonesia. Next year in B20 is the voice of the business at the G20 process. And we are concluding the B20 process, which also entails our task force on integrity and compliance. I'm co-chairing tomorrow and on Friday together with the full government of Italy and the government of Indonesia. And we will talk about uh, ethics, integrity, compliance, and many other topics if you're interested, this is also live streamed by the B20 organizers. If you go to their webpage, and I'm sure that's another very important topic for integrity and compliance. So if you want to talk a little bit uh, about ethics, I will start, of course, with our company, because this is important to understand the ecosystem where we all are working. So Novartis is one of the big pharmaceutical companies. We are employing roughly 110,000 associates all over the globe. And you see this on this presentation. The heart of what we are doing is research and development. And this is, of course, inherently already an ethical dilemma. Where do we put our basically 9 billion on research and development money to, to do our work? What are the right disease areas? Where can we make an impact to society? Where can we have impact on access to medicine for patients? The role of the pharmaceutical company, of course, was again elevated now during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's important to understand the ethics journey. We've been record low in all scores of reputation regarding a public organization, private organization. This has changed in the last year, but it's a fragile situation because as an industry which is involved by nature in so many ethical questions, because we are the industry which is maybe the closest industry to human life and health. We are of course very visible and have to be part of a societal debate on ethics. And again, it's a journey which potentially will never be finalized, but 
The question is now, how do we get this journey into the company? It's very timely because last week we had our global ESG investors day at Novartis. Our CEO, Vers Narasimham, spoke there. My colleague, Lutz Hegemann, who is responsible for the ESG office and strategy at Novartis. My colleague, Karen Hale, the chief legal officer, and myself. And we talked about our ethical journey as part of our ESG journey. And you see on the slide all the areas we are working. And why I'm bringing this slide, because we did an intensive stakeholder mapping and discussion. What matters most from environmental, social governance topics to, uh, to our stakeholders, to uh, our counterparts in society. And it's a lot about innovation, access to health, responsible pricing, but ethical business conduct was one of the top priorities we have seen also as feedback from investors, NGOs, academics, and governments. So just to start quickly, how do we bring this into the company, into the organization? So we have committed, we are committed on an integrated ethics, risk management and compliance system. And when I spoke last to you at this conference a year ago, I, I just gave you more detail how all the things are fitting together. And we see this more and more. The more we invest in, in enterprise risk management, the more we see the ethical dilemmas and topics. And I give you one example already quite early in the presentation. If you just take the topic of artificial intelligence, the responsible and ethical use of artificial intelligence, which is a core topic also for our company, for our industry, because we apply artificial intelligence in many ways in our companies. We believe this is a very important tool to research and develop on medicine, to get more patients, diverse patients in clinical trials. But we also had to recognize the ethical challenges, the biases in artificial intelligence. So that's a, a concrete, a specific output of our enterprise risk management system and shows you the close link between ethics and enterprise risk management and compliance, which then follows on with specific rules and guidelines. And you see, to operate, operationalize this, you have to really look at the various topics you have to address in your ethics, risk, and compliance strategy. And you see here the topics listed on the slides. If this is creating a safe place to speak up, psychological safety is very much linked to ethics and good compliance. And also, by the way, to good risk management, because what we also have learned in our risk discussions and risk workshops across the company, the more you create psychological safety, the more risks you see and the better open discussion you have there. The same is true also for following up, for remediation, for monitoring. And very important, you only can have an ethical debate if you have enough psychological safety in the company to put the real dilemmas, which really matters for the colleagues in the countries, for the company on the table. So how, how we approach this from a strategic point of view? I think the first assumption is to, to recognize the importance of ethics in the company. And you know, if you permit me a little bit of provocative and bold statement, which is maybe a really provocative, for many, good compliance is not good enough if you want to earn or build back trust with society as a company. Because basically the society, and again, we are part of society, expects basically that we as companies, as organizations are complying with the law. They expect that we are competent if not, we would not be in the market. But this is not the big, the big lever to change, to bring back trust with society. This is the belief that 
in, in society that companies work with integrity and ethics. This is the big, the big differentiator. And that's a tough message for many compliance professionals because, and I'm one of you, we all know how challenging it is to comply with the laws and regulation, especially in a regulated industry where we have hundreds of regulations around the globe we have to comply with, right? So it's, it's really at the next level, but not forgetting that we need a sound and proper and good compliance system. But again, not enough to create trust in companies from a societal point of view, because it's often the ethical dilemmas which are shaping the trust or creating the mistrust in companies. And you may have seen this picture already before, but I like it, I like it very much. This is the, the idea of the, the ethical iceberg. So what does this mean? If you have ethical dilemmas, we can address them above the surface, which is the visible dilemmas. This is often the law we have to comply with our internal rules, and we can address them by good training, regulations, good policy making. But then the question is, is this, is this enough? And you know, I'm not, I'm not myself a behavioral scientist, but I learned a lot about behavioral science in our journey the last few years on our ethical journey. And we learned that these biases, the unconscious biases are maybe the main topic we need to address. And you can only address them together with all of the associates in the company, and I come to this in a second. Because these biases are basically determining how we are behaving in a specific situation, a specific context. And we are often not aware of these, of these biases. So how have we addressed this? How, we can, how can we operationalize ethics in business? Yes, we need a code of conduct, a code of ethics. And we had a good code of conduct in place at Novartis, a good legal document the people were trained on, had to certify. But the point was when in, uh, when in 2019, we asked the associates globally, does the code of conduct we have in place resonates with you as a support? Is this a resource you consult if you are in an ethical dilemma, yes or no? And the answer was, it's a legal document, I have to comply, but I don't find the answer how I should behave in a conflict, in an ethical conflict. So we said, we, we need, of course, also for legal reasons, a code of ethics, code of conduct, but it has to be, a, it has to be a, different, a different model. So we said we need a clear distinction of commitments, what we commit from a legal, ethical point of view, and basic principles we want to adhere to. And we need to discuss these basic principles and the commitments with the whole, the whole organization. And you here see, you see the four ethical principles we came up with. And you can debate if these are the right ones, but I can tell you these are the ones we discuss with our associates at Novartis. So how did we do this? Because the topic of this speech is operationalizing ethics. Is this a mission impossible or is it possible? So we use significantly digital platform, user towns, town halls, workshops, and we roughly on this drafting journey of the ethical principles and the commitments we involved already several thousands of associates of Novartis around the globe in interactive settings, we could, because we all did this during the pandemic, don't forget. But as much as the pandemic was, of course, a big, a big burden on our shoulders as human beings, it was helpful for us in the way, because the people were used to work in a digital way. They were used to, uh, to speak to others in a an, in an workshop atmosphere in a, in a digital way. So, it was for us a big experiment, but in a setting where the people also embraced the possibilities of collaborating in a, in a digital environment. And you see, 
these ethical principles are underpinned by questions. And I come back to these questions because what we also learned in ethical dilemmas, you often can't give an answer. You can ask questions. And if you ask the right questions, you may come alone or together with other colleagues to the right answer, which basically means doing what's right after a conscious process. So is a code of ethics enough? No. So we said we have elaborated, we have co-created with thousands of associates the code of ethics. But we need to get to go a step further. We need to get the next level. And we said we need to create, to operationalize ethics an, an ecosystem around the code of ethics, a resource. And again, to avoid a misunderstanding, this resource is not to give you specific answers for your ethical dilemma, but it's there to support you. So what, what are we offering? We are offering a decision explorer. That means you can mirror your ethical dilemma with on, on an interactive IT platform with a decision explorer who asks you questions about your ethical dilemma you can reflect on. And afterwards, this decision explorer gives you a feedback on the biases the decision explorer has uh, perceived in the way how you ethical dilemma. And I can tell you my own major bias is, is overconfidence. It's classical for a compliance professional. You always believe you have seen so much, 20 years in the battlefield of compliance, you know all the answers, and you fall into this trap of, of overconfidence. So this decision explorer, it takes you only, only a couple of minutes to go through, and this decision explorer then links you to uh, the toolbox. The toolbox has one very nice tweet, it can connect you directly with a real person, a member of the ethics, risk and compliance team, who supports you in an in a in-person discussion. It links you to reading materials about our biases, which you have identified. It connects you with a huge support platform for case studies you can use in your management meetings as a nudge to get people into a sales meeting before you start first your debate about a compliance topic, a compliance case, which has occurred, real life cases, or an ethical dilemma we have observed in the company. So it's a lot about what you see leadership, about also sharing vulnerability of the issues where we maybe have no answer, innovation and collaboration. Now you, you may ask and say, well, what is the practical output? Is this effective? So the good thing in, uh, in these digital platforms is that you can, of course, track. You can track if this is used or not. So I give you some, a number. So we have tracked and seen that since we started a year ago with our ethics week to promote and implement the code of ethics in the platform, we have now seen roughly 200,000 visits to the platform. So we have roughly 110,000 associates at Novartis, and this means that a lot of them are using, at least from time to time, not daily, but the virtual code of ethics platform and all the tools which are promoting and proposing there for their support. And I believe that's a quite positive and, and good outlook and answer for, for the future, and that this is really used and not only presented to our employees, to our associates to use it. Another topic I want to spend a couple of words is where do we start with operationalizing ethics in a big organization? And again, it's not so much about private or public because big organizations follow the same rules. They have all the risk of not creating psychological safety for the people working in these big organizations. 
that's inherent for all organizations. Again, if it's private or public, if it's an NGO, if it's a for-profit organization, if it's a big public authority. And I think it's also part of the acknowledgement when we operationalize ethics that it's not a topic for the private sector alone. It's also one of my, <clears throat> my statements tomorrow at the B20 Summit. This is not something we only should adapt and discuss in the private sector. We, seem, we see the same issues, the same topics in all organizations, in sports federations, everywhere. So it's not specific only for, for profit companies. So the question was, uh, where do we start? And you all compliance risk ethics professionals, you know about the importance of training and we do training, of course, completely different than maybe 10 years ago. With the old fashioned PowerPoint training, you don't get the people, the young people uh, engaged. We're using gamification. It's what we call our ethics land game at Novartis, which is super popular, super popular. It's a, a kind of animated game where you can score, you can win. It's, it's super successful, especially in the younger generation. Onboarding, continuous training curriculum. But is this, is this really, is this really enough? So we thought, why don't we go a step further? Why don't we say, um, we start with operation, operationalizing ethics in the hiring process. So we called it, you see this on the slide, hiring for integrity, which basically means that very, from a very practical point, and we work together with our HR organization, which we call people and organization at Novartis, that we train our recruiters, we bring ethical dilemmas and questions into the recruitment interview toolbox, and we confront also people who want to work for Novartis, who apply for a job at Novartis, that they uh, bring their ethical dilemmas discussion already into in, in the procurement process. In the, sorry, not the procurement process, in the application process. And this is a fascinating experience. You, are, you, you understand that the, 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 the applicants who want to go for a job and we have thousands and thousands every year we, we retain for the company. They, they, they believe, well, we test their competence. We be, they believe we test their leadership experience, their subject matter experience, how well they are as scientists, as uh, development specialists, procurement specialists, whatever. And then you, you nudge them, you confront them in the interview process with an ethical dilemma. How would you behave as a sales representative for Novartis if you can't achieve your target because you have a situation where you believe the target is simply too high and you would need to go to a illegal means to achieve your targets. What would you do? What would you do? Or for procurement hiring position, how would, how would you deal with a conflict of interest if in one of your suppliers are responsible a friend is working and proposes his or her company as a future business partner for Novartis. What would you do? How would you how would you react? How would you react if you see uh, if you see unethical behavior with your manager, with your leader? What would you do? Would you raise it? If yes, to whom? So this this project we are running this now for the first time is, is another great laboratory. It gives you a huge insight how to operational, operationalize ethics even before you start working for the company. And then because I want to leave also enough time for our, our discussion, we measuring. So we've started an ethical baseline survey and we are this an add-on to the service we do in the company on culture anyway we're measuring the cultural development every quarter in the company and we also have their questions regarding ethics and trust in the company and trust in management in there but we did an ethical baseline survey on top and you see on the slide it's a little bit a complicated survey but we were totally surprised how many associates around the globe answered fully or at least partially the survey. Ten thousands of answers. In a, and you know, in these digital times, the people have more or less a little bit of resistance 
again, too many service uh, because we get it all the time, right? You know the topic. So we got a phenomenal, phenomenal feedback from our associates. We take this data now from the ethical baseline survey to have deep discussions with the management, which gaps we have seen, the good things we have seen, a lot of good outcomes. So one outcome of the ethical baseline survey was that the, the, the vast majority of the associates believes that they work in a company which want to do the right thing, which is basically very focused on ethical business practices. Is, again, therefore, we got the Code of Ethics working. How do I get help in my context, in my country situation to address ethical dilemmas? So we saw exactly in the survey the, the topics why we, we put the Code of Ethics in the platform in place. We will continuously build on this survey. We do it also next year to see how we develop. And we link this survey to the measurement of the effectiveness of our compliance system. Just remember, ethics, risk management, and compliance belongs together. The output we get from our ethical baseline survey is of huge interest in our new measurement of the effectiveness of the compliance system. We measure the effectiveness of our compliance systems. We have more than 200 KPAs identified in prevent, detect, response areas for our compliance management system. But most of them are very technical. Feedback from audits, from investigations, controls, training numbers, all very technical. But now we get the feedback from the ethical baseline survey in. And this, we are sure, will enhance the quality and the effectiveness of our compliance system significantly. That's, again, operationalizing ethics in the corporation. So before I, I end and show you a quick uh, video, uh, I just want to make one statement. This is not overconfidence. We know that we have misconduct, individual misconduct in all big organizations, including at Novartis. This you will potentially never change. But what we want to change is a systematic approach. And we believe it's not enough just to put a first class compliance system in place. A first class compliance system needs the ethical parts, needs operationalizing ethics into the compliance system. Again, it's a journey. We are not there yet, but we, what we see from the early indicators and we're sharing this with the authorities, with the US Department of Justice and other authorities is quite promising. And then before we go to the Q&A, a quick video, because it's also about keeping the topic visible in companies, having impact. So we do every year an ethics or ethics risk and compliance week where we engage basically the whole company. You will see our CEO, Vasner Simham, sitting next to me and also making his clear statements about ethics risk and compliance. Most people you will see on the video are not from ethics risk and compliance organization. These are colleagues from the business, from research and development. You see Delia Ferrara, who is the Global Chair of uh, Transparency International, we invited her to have a critical voice also. That's also important in the ethics discussion, to have a critical voice, not only a supporting voice in the audience. And I show you the video, and then we can go to Q. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone, and welcome to ERC Week. Wow, let's get it started. <laughs> <That's a great laughs> idea. Finding medicines that matter for patients and get them distributed with broad access around the world is the core. Alongside that, continuing to be a leader on ethics, risk, and compliance topics, which almost is, is the basics. Patient's voice has become way more powerful. At Novartis, we want to use AI in the most responsible way, in ethical way, and we would like to empower humanity. To be the inspirational catalyst to put the right, sometimes, Difficult question on the table. You need the voice of the people and the efforts of the people who are like-minded, who work with the highest integrity, to make sure that we are doing what we need to do for the patients to reach our medicines in a timely way. It's an opportunity here at Novartis to bring that voice into what we do in 
the development of our medicines. I'm super proud of this. We took on and accepted that challenge to try to find ways to uh, assist patients. It's not science fiction, it's science in action. It's how we are changing the standard of care. I think without you, we can't achieve what we want to achieve. We have to take into account that integrity is not a state, it is an act. We work at a company whose core product is medicine, and we are helping people realize the human right to health. Let's get into it. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So you see, fun is also important uh, in such an uh, ethics or ethics risk and compliance week. Uh, and we just concluded a week a couple of days ago in August. So a couple of weeks ago, it was a great time. Hello. Hello, Dr. Klaus Morsmeyer. Thank you so much for your thought provoking presentation. And we've got lots of questions from our ECEC community for you. So the first one that's been most popular because they get voted um, the questions for, for which ones are most relevant. Dr. Morsmeyer, this question comes from Bogdan Fratiliu. Excuse me if I have not mispronounced your name. The question is, how do you explain the compliance incidents or possibly misconduct you experience in Greece and South Korea, having in view you have a strong compliance program in place there? Is this a problem of ethics? Yeah, thank you for the question, Dr. And I mean, mentioning about Korea, uh, it's a noble task of new management to work on legacy compliance topics. I mean, before you, in parallel, if you start building back trust with society, you need to solve in close collaboration with the authorities your legacy compliance topics. And no, it is, could be a long journey. If you look at our legacy cases we had settled last year, mid of last year, with the DOJ and the SEC, all of the FCPA uh, allegations, it took us some time. These topics are sometimes going back many years, but it's the task of the new management of the martyrs to get this done. Now, it's too easy to say these are legacy cases. Years ago, we have to embrace the learning. So what we do, we use these legacy cases and also ongoing cases we see, as I said, individual misconduct you always will have in big organizations for case studies, putting them into the ethical toolbox you just have seen in my presentation and talk, talking openly about it. And this also builds trust with the authorities. I'm a constant exchange with the, uh, the authorities in the US and elsewhere because they understand this and see this also as, uh, as trust building. Thank you for the question. Thank you for your answer. We've got plenty more questions from Malte Torba. Thank you for sending in your question. Dear Dr. Morsmeyer, aren't ethics and profit-oriented business, businesses in a capitalist society contradicting each other in many situations, for example, as recently shown in discussions about a vaccine patent waiver? Yeah. First of all, I believe Innovation, this is we, we have seen this in the pandemic, in, innovation is the key for getting out of this pandemic. If there would be no innovation, to a huge extent also privately financed innovation, there will be no cure. And you know, just to give you a, a little bit of insight in our industry, we it takes 10 to 15 years to develop innovative medicines against the cancer, against the cardiovascular disease. Most of the research and development projects we undertake uh, fail because that's science. Nobody pays us for this. If you're not profit, profitable, if you would not be able to spend the eight or nine billion a year in research and development, there would be no innovation. If you don't protect intellectual property there will be no innovation. The next pandemic, there will be no cure. 
And therefore, we have to find the right balance in a good societal debate. What is the right balance to get as many vaccines for everyone, but also protect the innovation? And that's a discussion we need, we need to have with the governments and with the companies. Thank you. Next question from Karin Holloch. Thank you for sending your question in, Karin. She says, whistleblowers in Europe are still not effectively protective, protected, and they often lose their job and have problems to find a new employer as a result of whistleblowing. Does this show the unconscious bias of employers towards whistleblowers? Oh, great question, Karin, and great to hear you again, at least uh, virtually. We know each other quite well. Yeah, I mean, the topic of whistleblowers, indeed, there's a lot of unconscious bias regarding whistleblowers. I mean, even the word whistleblower, if we reflect uh, on the word, is this a word which really adequately describes the value at of people who have concerns and to want to speak up. And therefore, you know, at Novartis, and that's maybe just the name, but it, it's, that's where our ambition a little bit, where our vision is that we, we talk about the speak up office. We want to have people who, who speak up. It's of course a duty of the company to try to protect whistleblowers or speak up colleagues as much as we can. But we also have to be, Karen, and you know this as a true professional, we have to be honest. We can't, we can't give 100% protection. And I give you a classical example. A public authority, a prosecutor, may always want to know who the reporter is. And we are obliged by law in many countries to give the prosecutor the name, the name of the, of the person who had a complaint. So we can't rule this possibility out. And we, should be careful not to overpromise on this. But we should be caring. We should be caring in our speak up office with the colleagues who have a concern, stay in close contact, support them, also potentially in finding new opportunities in the company because sometimes the own environment is difficult to stay there for someone who has spoken up and reported. But always be honest and not overpromising what we what we can deliver. But closing there on this, and you know, I'm very. It's a topic which is goes close to my heart. There is no effective compliance system if you don't have also a good system for people who want to speak up, because we need this. We love to see, of course, that the number of anonymous complaints goes down because this shows trust. But we always need this open door for people who have a concern and want to speak up in a confidential way. Thank you, Karen, for the great question. Okay, where, at which level in businesses and corporations do you see misconduct happening most? Because, for example, I spoke to someone recently who works at, worked at Wirecard, and she said the corporate culture was fantastic and everyone was working towards transparency and great communication and transparent products, and they had a whistleblowing um, system in place, and yet, those reports went nowhere, as we know. So you talk about operationalizing um, ethics and compliance in the base, but where do you see most misconducts happening? Yeah. Is that in the base or is, are we talking top management? Uh, super, super question. And I, I think maybe why I can't, and I'm not an expert in this, I'm just what I read is maybe in, in many regards similar to the N1 case, which has happened many years ago. So it's, we are falling back into the old habit sometimes in big corporation. I believe we all know about the relevance of what we call middle management, middle management, but it starts, of course, at the top. I give you one practical example in our company. We made as an executive team a commitment that we undergo the same unbossed leadership journey we expect from all our managers to become better servant leaders. There's no exception. Our CEO, Vasner Sinem, has to undergo the same 360 feedback with us as his team. I have to go the same process with my leadership team. And I see this in most companies failing. Because the board or the executive committee says, oh, that's, that's a new culture, that's the workshop, please apply it. But I'm, I, I'm standing at the sideline. And my question would be, the people in these companies like Wirecard and Enron, was there really a personal commitment by the top leadership to 
to live up to the same values? Did they participate in 360 degree feedback? Do they have own coaches? Are they on a servant leadership journey? Are they talking about vulnerability, which is still a difficult topic for executives and companies or not? If not, if top management says the new culture is fine for you guys, but not for me, it will absolutely fail. Okay, thank you for your answer. We have a question from Julia Novakovic. Thanks for sending your question in, Julia. Can you give an example of one of the seven individual virtues that you defined? We, what was the question of the seven? Um, can you give an example of one of the seven individual virtues you defined? Can you yeah. hear me? I mean, accountability is a super important topic for because accountability in companies is a, is a difficult thing because we all work into the matrix. And the question is, where is my accountability starting? And we are, and we are of course, in big organizations are struggling. And being bold and being open about the issues I see with my accountability in a company is very important. Be open-minded. It's another super important topic we need to raise because we all, especially going back to your question about top management, we're all very good in speaking as I'm speaking now, answering questions. Are we in a similar way good to listen? And listening means active listening, not just listening. This is this virtue where I believe this is this be open minded, be listening, talking about accountability. These are topics which I would name them. Okay, how have you been able to measure the trust, the gains in trust at Novartis over the last three years? Yeah, we are, we are as many of you, a data driven company, and of course, we believe in the significance of data and fact as a scientific as a scientific organization as well. However, again, there we have to be careful about the, the danger of biases we have in our systems. And I give you one example before, before I answer the question. What we have seen, if you put, for example, algorithms into the higher process, companies who did this, who wanted to create more diversity in the workforce, what they got were more applications from white male because we put our own our own biases into the algorithm. So we have to be careful about the data we are gathering. But if we have good and structured data, we can follow up. So what we are doing is we are quarterly measuring the cultural pulse of the whole organization. How is the trust and management development? How is the collaboration developing? How is the speak up culture developing? And I must say this is this is a good check in for the management and see where we are. And also one very important question I just discussed with the Italian management team here at Novartis is how many of the associates recommend their own manager to another associate? And we moved there up as an example from three years ago, we had a, a rate of 65% of the associates saying I would recommend my manager to another associate. We're now more than 80% would do this. So obviously something is working. So we're using the data, we're addressing the gap in the coaching in the journey. This is how we try to, uh, to go for it. Okay, one final question for you because uh, there's many, but this one's really popular from Hervé Soymier. Thank you for sending your question in. When you do job interviews, Dr. Morsmeyer, do you use a standard compliance questionnaire? No, because we believe it depends a lot on the specific roles and responsibilities you have in a job interview. If you, are, if you hire scientists in early research, it's a lot about ethical and data integrity challenges in, in research and development, very scientific based. If you go for a sales representative who works in the commercial units, these are more the topics of conflict of interest, bribery topics. So you have to adapt this. But what we do in our approach to have this hiring for integrity toolbox now in the hiring process is we are, faced, we are using ethical dilemmas which are fitting to the specific role we are hiring for and confronting in a nice way, respectful way, 
the job applicant and say how would you react in this position just to to make clear we want to have this discussion in the company but it needs to be specific to the context if not it makes no sense great question thank you Dr. Morsmeyer, I'm afraid we've run out of time. There's plenty of questions. Your presentation has generated a lot of interest. So thank you so much for joining us again this year, 2021. All the best. Hope to see you next year. Thank you. Got a conference.